While billions of people reap the benefits of the technologies that are transforming everyday's lives, uh, just as many are facing a digital divide with underserved communities still lacking basic infrastructure and services. How can we use technology to improve living standards as well as promote sustainable and inclusive development within those disadvantaged communities? We're gonna hear now from a diverse group of entrepreneurs with expertise in agriculture technology, FinTech, and robotics. We hope their experiences and insights will inspire more tech entrepreneurs to make a positive social impact in their respective markets. Please welcome Just, Justin Gong, Jeffrey Prentice, which side are you guys? There you are. Uh, Yao Zhang, and Fortune's Clifton Leaf. Come on out. to be more lively than the way we just walked up on stage. I think that was, that was very, very slow. But we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a very interactive panel. I wanna point out that, you know what, just follow up on what Alan just said, is that you're all entrepreneurs. You know, you're all out there, you know, pursuing business models, but you're also doing well by doing good because you're actually solving an unmet need in each case. And, and you're doing it in radically different ways. Yao, you, you build robots, uh, educational robots. Um, Jeff, you're, um, you know, building an entire financial infrastructure in places that don't have it and a credit rating infrastructure. And uh, Justin, you build extraordinary uh, drones in a, to solve an agricultural issues. Um, and these things are controlled, uh, you know, remotely uh, in the cloud and you, with a push of a button. And you've got how many flights now that you've got active right this minute? We're running about 42,000 drones every day and we receive about 1.2 million flights in our cloud. And, and you're just sitting here relaxed, you know, you're not, <laughs> you're not there on a screen and everything. So, and, you're, and this is what's amazing is that you're serving a population that has really never had any remotely this kind of, uh, of, 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 of technology. And what, why did you see this as a problem to solve? I think we are facing a, a very big uh, challenge, which is population explosion yeah. against the land degradation. Um, and the smallholder farmers, they hold the key for the future, for food diversification, for biodiversity, for sustainability. So we need to help farmers raise ways the consumers upgrading. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no sort of financial literacy at a certain level in the kind of the populations that you serve. Uh, tell us a little bit about the business first. No, but yeah, so basically we're doing financial um, uh, services in Southeast Asia. And I think one of the things before when I was, what was great about doing this is we kind of at Skype, we tried to build this digital infrastructure to make communications happening. Yeah. And one of the great things about that was actually that you could actually make a lot of money, but you also helped a lot of people. That's right. a very nice thing to be able to have. It is, it's a nice company. I became a venture capitalist and that was not as fun. Right. So I said, what could be only something as fundamental as, um, uh, uh, as communication? And that would be kind of democratizing financial services in Southeast Asia. I mean, the only thing that could be more, probably more fundamental would actually be Eating, so the, the, you know, right. what you are doing could be the only thing that's there's, more like that. There's no reason you can't do a deal yeah, here. Exactly. No, no, but, it, right. but it really is when you're helping people on that fundamental level. It's a real, it's a real, real fun thing to do. Yes. But you know, I just want to drill down a little bit on. on so people come in to shop in in stores like you know, like a Target or whatever yeah. the equivalent is, and you size them up for credit, right? Yeah. Away, because many people don't actually have the credit to purchase the, the things that they need, whether it's a rice cooker or Correct. whatever it is. Um, and so you give that credit to them in about eight minutes flat, yeah. and, um, and then they pay a, a monthly interest. Installments, yeah. and it's yeah. really important. Like we tried to use minimum payments like a credit card. That yeah. does not work because the, I was, the financial literacy is very, very high. Yeah. But the actual, uh, very low, but the actual technology literacy is high. So it's, it's, it's kind of backwards. So you get to do installments exactly the same amount every month to kind of make it work. But before, and, and oh, I want to get to you just in one second, but, but I want to follow up with one really interesting thing, Jeff, is that, you know, you're, you also combine a very analog way of doing business with your technology. Uh, you've got people in the stores who will, 
judge you and say, yeah, okay, you're alive. Yeah, right? that's one thing. We, we, we think we have some of the best technology in the world. My other <laughs> co-founder was the head of technology at Lufax and built the whole team there. But when you're giving money out, like, you got to make sure you get the money back. Right. So you can't kind of, you can't be 95% right. You got to be kind of right, right most of the time. So we focus on, one of the things that we do is we actually have people in the store who actually size people up. The one thing that we do know is that uh, in these markets, like, Facebook and Google are making a fortune because we actually, it's actually cheaper for us to, to get a customer right. through these people on the ground than it is actually advertising on the internet. That's, that's wild. Yeah, you, you know, you are a completely different technology, robots, and they're robot kits that, that serve uh, educational markets, and you've also scaled up very fast. I mean, you know, you've been, you know, uh, You've won every, I think, young entrepreneur where there is. I was looking at your bio. Uh, but, you know, why, why go through this, uh, the kit business, sort of serving the educational market? The, the kid or a kit. Kid. Both. <laughs> kit and kit. Yes, yeah. kids for a kid. Yeah. Totally. Kids for kids. Um, yeah, so... Um, um, I got my training in economics and education at Columbia University and then uh, the passion really to help lear making learning more fun. That was a very you know, original idea, uh, or in Chinese we call it chu xin. Mm -hmm. And then um, um, during my doctoral studies I was never a normal student uh, or a typical student. Or in other words, I was not really a good student because I like to, you know, um, basically spent more time hands, of hands-on experiences instead of only, you know, doing the data work as part of the, you know, the program requirement. So very soon, and also with learning in, you know, more understanding in cognitive sciences, uh, it's just known that when kids' hands are involved in the learning process, what's happening at the brain level is just totally different. So that's why um, after, you know, having my first company in, in software, uh, which is called Minds Abroad, and then uh, with the, you know, the taste of being an, a startup entrepreneur, learned a lot uh, of uh, serving the global market, and then still with the same passion or choosing, and then I realized that with the fast development in, you know, small quantity prototyping, uh, 3D printing and all that, it, 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 it made it possible for product people like me who never had hard hardware experiences yeah. being able to bring hardware products in you know into market so that was the beginning of kids for kids and how did how did you kids for see I when we coined a term here uh, that's fantastic so but how did you get into the robot building and how young were you when you started this uh, you mean, uh, me for the company. Yeah, for you. Oh, yes. So Roboterra was uh, started about uh, five years ago, literally from my garage in Silicon Valley. Um, and then, uh, so the company's five years, and then w today we're in more than 40 countries, serving more than a thousand schools, mm -hmm. uh, 20, 30 thousands of you know students and teachers. And then uh, we, uh, so today uh, our teams are mainly in the U.S. and China. And, and you're seeing and bringing more women and girls into this, into robot building, into, into the world of, of sensors and, and internet of things and technology? Well, proudly speaking, I believe we actually achieved indeed on, uh, you know, on, on that. So not only uh, me being a female uh, tech person, right. um, but uh, also hands-on, or in other words, we like to call ourselves nerd, real nerds. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's fun. It's just really fun when you have uh, open-end challenge and then providing the the, the modules to allow right. unlimited designs. Uh, so that's how. How did you think about becoming like building robots? I yeah. mean, like to wake up in the morning and say, like, you know, I'm a PhD and whatever. I'm going to start building robots. How does that kind of happen? Well, it's not the blue pill or red pill yeah, choice, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, as I briefly <laughs> mentioned. So the training in economics education, you know, it's a lot are yeah. literally big data in education, understanding the market, understanding behaviors, public and um, private investment, and also learning results, as I right. said. So I'm the oldest of a family of four. Sorry, my siblings mm -hmm. out there. Um, but uh, yeah. fortunately, I was just born and lucky enough to have all the great teachers made my learning very fun. So right. I'm not the hardest working kid of my family. but. I'm always, You're not the hardest. I'm person. not, oh, but wow. I okay. have, we have to meet this somehow. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm the, the, the luckiest, you know, yeah. to, to to end up to be always you know the top in the class and in best schools. So my siblings. So I started to ask a question. I believe my siblings are right. at least as, as smart. They're yeah. actually a lot, you know, real much smarter. So 
so what's the issue? And then I believe that I just play more. And then so that's where I, you know, I just, you know, and again, the, 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 the learnings and researches in, in brain sciences about learning results, yeah. uh, I just, and also with the fast development, as you mentioned, you know, a, a, around 2013, 2014, IoT development right. made it very visible to bring need, the need to bring hardware into classroom setting as yeah. well. Yeah, no, so it's a whole new generation. Just in backstage, we were talking about you spent a year at Caltech, and your your as your requirements were five math classes, and then you had two optional classes, which right. were math classes. Yeah. <laughs> So is I mean when we were talking about education I mean that that was not appealing to you at all you wanted to go out and build something right. and you built giant amazing four rotor yes. helicopter drones that you know that do all sorts of uh, work on in agriculture so talk a little bit about how you moved away from you know the standard technology training that we think about as mm -hmm. you know uh, and, and and started to become a business builder yes so after quit from Caltech, I went to Sydney University to study economics and business <laughs> information systems. Oh, so funny. it's about big data, right. statistics, SWAT society, how it works. And then after that, I, I got a job at NetGeo as a documentary producer. Wow. So I got a chance to, to see the nature, to see the biodiversity, right? And um, that's how I started using drones. I built my own drone in 2019, 2009. That was before we can buy off the shelf, you know, right. the, the photography drone. And I was chasing the birds, migration, using my drone in the field. And that's how I met my partner, business partner. He was a programmer mm -hmm. online, and we met on the GitHub. And we talked about how to make the drone stable. And then in 2013, he said, you know, look, we have built the drone, and we found so many applications. We are using the drone to search and rescue, delivery things, science, science uh, expedition in Antarctica. Shall we, you know, build a company? to really commercialize the drone technology. And that's how we started. And we chose agriculture because I think to use drones, a farmer to use drones have much more benefit than someone in the city just making a drone, um, using a drone, make self selfies. So that's how we transit from um, pure geeks into um, a farmer. What I think is the most yeah. fascinating part though for me for what you're doing though is that you're taking something like, you're working with basically like Farmers like very like not massive not, not massive farms right I mean you're talking about these small orders small, small yeah yes. so you're taking technology mm -hmm. and applying that to literally these tiny tiny farmers living in Indonesia or in China yes, yes. so I, for me the interesting is the dichotomy of using the most high end AI technology on the planet yeah, yeah. and then merging it with like sort of subsistence, subsistence the, the, farms. the problem with our food and agriculture system today is the big farm they don't need. Um, innovation. They don't need um, efficiency because they already have. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And ask them to change from a big boom sprayer, John Deere tractor is very hard. Right. Smaller drones and robots. But for a smallholder farmer, they have nothing to lose. If we can go with fi fintech, mm -hmm. new finance, um, along with technology and just to help them to improve their quality of food and also to help build the transparency. So people in the city, the consumers, are willing to pay for the premium. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that can be the future because it's solving the problem of increasing demand for diversity, um, for quality of food, but also we're changing the tools being used for thousand years at this end of uh, producers. So build, by building this bridge, this connection, you will see a lot of things are happening in yeah, Chinese villages. It's amazing. Yeah. Jeff, you know, we were talking also about the fact that, you know, in the West, you know, we look at credit scores and we're like, oh God, I got to deal with a credit score. But it is a luxury and, it, and it actually a fundamental necessity in terms of building a financial system and that it's missing in so much of the places that you work in. And so you're building this from scratch, essentially. Yeah, so nobody has, your phone number's not tied to you. Right. National ID systems don't work. So basically, the largest um, uh, lender in the Philippines is a pawn shop. Okay, so this is kind of what you're dealing with. And half of the people who borrow money, borrow, half the people of the country borrow from an informal lender every single month. Right. So I mean, these systems just do not work whatsoever. So you have to kind of build this whole entire digital layer to kind of lift people up. And I think that's the fun part about this discussion for me is that to use technology to really help people from, use the most cutting edge technology to give these invisible kind of forgotten people the opportunity to do much bigger things. Yeah, yeah, it's a, and, and you talk about in terms of the repayment, what is your repayment rate? 
Uh, we, it's about four, three to four percent a month, so about thirty-five percent to forty-five percent. Not in terms of. So I'm saying, well, how, what's your default rate? Oh, a default rate is about five uh, percent. Five percent. Yes. And how does that compare with, say, in, in the in the businesses in your uh, environments in the Philippines and elsewhere? I mean, th that's a pretty good rate to be doing it. But I mean, our, our job is what I what I focus on. What happens? The one thing technology allows us to do is basically what, the, what these pawn shops and these five, six lenders are called, they charge one, between one and two and a percent a day. Yeah. Their whole business is based on unit economics, which very simply, which means if I give you this much money, I want to get, you know, they want to, get, they want to maximize the money they make per dollar. Right. We kind of use the technology idea, which is sort of the Alibaba idea or whatever, which is that total addressable market, let's just make a little bit of money on each person, and then that's how we're going to make money on the law of large numbers, not on kind of the unit economic base. So, so let that's me what ask technology you, allows us to change that. Let me ask you each the classic business question, which is, are you profitable? And I know that you could be profitable if you raised your interest rates, I know you've said, yeah. uh, but to, tomorrow, but do you have a, a plan for when you think you'll get there? Q4 will be there. This, this, oh. uh, well, no, sorry, next, next Q4. Next Q4, okay, because yes. this is... But again, it comes back to how much we want to grow. Right, yeah. right. But I think that's kind of the... The problem that we have in these markets, and it happens in a lot of things, but financial services is the worst, is that when we hear about fintech, there's two parts, there's two layers. One is the front end, yeah. one end is the back end. So what's happened is people have used the front end, they basically said, we're fintech, and then what they do is they, they use the front end to put a loan shark basically online. Right. That's what they've done. That goes very, very quickly. <laughs> that allows you to like nail people at a very far level. The slower part is building the infrastructure, yep. right? And that takes a longer time to do yes, the same. than and the same thing. So you got so, so it's kind of like the tortoise and the hare. We're right. kind of the tortoise going this way. So there's a lot of other lenders out there that you'll see who are making a lot of money, mm -hmm. right. but they're just all they're doing is they're putting a pretty Silicon Valley kind of face on it. But really, what they are is just loan sharks on them. Right, right. Yeah, are you making money? Are you? Uh, we. Proudly enough, this, love this as of this year, okay, yes, as right. of this year, five years, finally break even. Okay, great, <laughs> Justin. Yes, we're making money. Um, All right. We have a money pool, big money pool, because before the traditional chemical dealers, right, right. they are making a lot of money because of trans information. They can use the information, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but today, when you are using drones to spray chemicals for the farmer, it's really accurate. Right. So we have to pre-survey the land in order for the drones to, to fly autonomously. After we survey the land, we know exactly how much chemical to buy. So the farmer can save a lot of money. Right. The money will come to our service providers. How, and you, one of the challenges that you have is you're, you're teaching people who really never dealt with this level of technology, as Jeff was saying. You know, how do you bridge that divide? And this, is, this, this session is about bridging the yes. technological divide. Yes. According to the, the theory of uh, diffusion and innovation, Usually you have 5% of people in society will, will be the first group adoption right, right. For, the, for the technology. But we found out farmers in China, they are more willing to embrace technology than anyone else because they have nothing to lose. Mm. They have nothing mm. in the farmland. They have nothing to get the loan. They have nothing. They can trade in. So when you're trying to convince farmers, just one thing, reduce your cost, improve your yield. Right. Uh, and we, we, we introduce the technology down to very, very um, um, ground. How to do that is we provide drone spray services, the same price as tractors and the labor, uh, human spray. How, how do you find yeah. these people? I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah. thinking myself, like, yeah. how, what is your customer acquisition strategy? Yeah, it's a great question. In, in, the, in yeah. the smallholder community, you will always find the cooperative. Okay. So farmers getting together, buying tractors and yeah. big tools, they are our customers. Okay. So yeah. you convince them to try. We give them trial period, like non-deposit trial. We're working with Alipay, so mm -hmm. it's, it's a credit, uh, this zero deposit. After they try this, they find out they can save a lot of chemical, a lot of water, and it's more efficient. So they started, and the farmer get addicted to the mm. technology. And so, the other thing is, you, you yeah. can't ask a farmer to, farmer to be a pilot. It's so hard. So you have to have AI, right. cutting edge, True. to help them piloting the drones. So they just push the button, it sprays. It's incredible. And do you go into those fields wearing your black T-shirt and your Doc Martens? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> not really. I was wearing, I was wearing something I was wearing when I was a documentary maker. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. You know, we have. A, I want to go to some questions. So, if we've got some questions for these amazing entrepreneurs, uh, we have paddles in the back. Please identify yourself and uh, and ask a question. Anybody? Okay, we'll give you a minute to think about it. Um, yeah, um, you know, this, we, we do talk, I want to just come back to this idea of the fact that 
there's so much an effort to, for STEM, for, for girls and women, to bring women into this. It, I imagine that most of your life you've been probably one of the only women in your robotics groups and things like that. How, how do you change the language of, of this, the world you live in so that it appeals to, to a different group of people? Yeah, um, that's a very good and important question. Indeed, uh, you know, just like our tag, I believe uh, the change is really, you know, uh, happens about mindset or begin from there of mm -hmm. the people who's using certain technology for us. It's, you know, when we talk or think about how to uh, include more, more girls into tech, STEM learning, or even just as simple as coding or robotic building. So as mentioned, um, you know, so for, for, for Robotar, my company, the work method internally we call to, do, to achieve that is DFC, Design for Creativity. Uh -huh. So because that's you know what we emphasize as the, the, the core learning goal for, for everyone. So in the designing process, which includes the content, the teacher's training, how we will coach teachers to be aware to create a more inclusive classroom, you know, asking questions as many times to girls yeah. as to boys, and also when they're making student groups to work together or even create the open challenge kind of uh, you know semester projects for students. Students, even students who just are not that interested in, in coding, they still can be involved as like the fundraiser of their project, <laughs> the, the you know the cheerleader, the the the, the mascot, you know, a right. painter. So everyone has their ownership of the project, and then actually girls turn out to be um, you know as great as boys in developing their leadership skills and also interpersonal skills in that. And a lot of times, of course, we saw um, girls have very good, uh, strong presentation skills as well. Right. So the projects are collaborative. We call it a professional uh, uh, competitiveness that every student really benefit from that. So the whole process is, uh, you know, on, uh, on the innovator side is design for creativity or design for, for, for inclusion at both you know, coaching for teachers and also, you know, student so, use. So one, <coughs> my mom's a school teacher. So I would rather, it'd be easier for me to convince a farmer to use a drone mm -hmm. than my mom to use this technology to teach a new way. You know, so how do, you, how do you get teachers to come around to this? You're, you're so true, you're so true. You know, even, <laughs> you know, so actually for Robotica, Sorry, we're, we've been working with a lot of different foundations, including in Play International, um, um, you know, many different foundations to support rural schools, you know, uh, worldwide as well. So um, a lot of times what we encounter as the challenges are really, parents are saying, hey, I don't need my kids, you know, I don't need my girl to be in a class that that she you know, has nothing to do with her in the future. So there are indeed extra work we have to do in the, you know, the engagement or educational process, you know, ways that the, the, the parents to help them understand. It's, so it's not on the students. It, let, let me ask you, how many, and this is a legitimate question, I know it's gonna come out flip, but how many of the kids just wanna build killer robots? Because you know, when you watch those shows, I don't know, it, they're very popular in the you US. You want the real the answer? Yeah, I do, yeah. You know what? So whenever you tell a kid, you know, so, so we work in yeah. the age, for the age group basically nine years old all the way above to college level. Um, but you know, what we saw is when you are telling kids, especially primary school, middle school age, when you tell them, hey, we're gonna have a robotics class, everyone's, whoa, robotics. Yeah. And then if you have a robot demo, you know, a robot, any shape, put it on the table or on the floor, boys will come over just want to kick it. Yeah. That's a natural reaction. That's, they just want to exactly kick it right. and then yes. fight and punch. <laughs> and then you know, girls will be more, you know, right. exploring in a different way. Okay. So again, it, it, it goes to the, 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 the challenge that you design in what right. projects you want, you want students to build. Um, but yeah, the, the, the natural instinct students go into is they just want to fight yeah. with the thing they are building. So, so <laughs> we've got, we've just got a, a minute or so left. I just would love to just hear uh, you, just your thoughts about to the next generation of entrepreneurs who are doing this. Because you've all been so successful and you've been scaling up. What is the one piece of advice you would give, uh, Justin, to, to um, to, to an entrepreneur starting out. Right, if anyone who wants to start up some technology company in the village, think about more about the infrastructure. Today we are benefiting from a lot of things. We can use a phone to Uber a car, order a meal because we have the map and that's the infrastructure. Today we can navigate the cars whenever in, in the world because we have satellites. So think yeah. about infrastructure. Infrastructure, yes. yeah, let me, 
Uh, start with you. Yeah, um, so Roboterra is really a company using, applying robotics and AI, very advanced tech for education, which is, which is a very traditional space. So I would encourage all the entrepreneurs out there in or not in this space that don't be intimidated of a lot of the, the, the long-term challenges because uh, right. as long as you think out of the box, or especially on the design side, right. uh, you right. can come up with some interesting solutions. Do you have 10 seconds? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't focus on your, what great technology is, focus on solving a real problem. Yes. You solve the real problem, really? you solve the real problem. I'm That's trying to Those are <laughs> perfect words to end on. Thank you, Yao, Jeff, thank Justin. You. Thank you. Thank Great you. conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.